Okay there, so we're right at the top of the hour. Um, I'm gonna spend some time giving an intro, get some people joining. I know that a lot of people will join right at one and kind of lay out the land of what we're gonna accomplish over the next hour and what um, life will look like following this one. Um, so for those who don't know me, Misty Stutzman Fox, I am the Director of Entrepreneurship and Small Business at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families. I'm coming to you live from my living room. Um, for those who may have joined us last week, you know that you know at IVMF we're, we're staying flexible. We're trying to answer the questions that you have in a timely fashion. Um, if you were here with us a couple weeks ago, you also saw that part of that flexibility included a surprise visit from my father-in-law in the background. So I think that, you know, also sums up working from home pretty well. Um, you know, what we've heard of and what we keep asking in all of our signups for not only this, but for any communications that are going on um, are your updated concerns and what you're starting to think of um, as a business owner. We've done a lot of work uh, and thank you very much to the SBA to talk about the the PPP loans and the IDA loans and and what that looks like you may have seen the uh, um, chat we had two weeks ago and then of course the Facebook live we had last week with Ray Milano so we're gonna get an update from Larry Stubblefield here in a little bit um, from there we've brought on two business owners that can talk through you know what they're doing what they've seen as successful um, in these times what what they've seen, you know, that has worked that, you know, may not, may not have worked so well. So talk about some triumphs and, and maybe a few failures here and there. And then we, you know, want to spend a lot of time on the Q&A side with you. As you know, we reserve about half the hour on the Q&A. The important part about that is if you have a question, just type it into the chat. I have a team that is um, going through that chat at any time. Um, they'll be making sure to pop those over so that I can, you know, ask our panelists. But also, we have a lot of great VSOs and resource partners and the SBA themselves that are actually signed on um, as a part of the attendees. So you might see, you know, Stan Kurtz or Ray Milano. I know I saw Amy Amoruso last time, you know, just giving replies as well. So look out for it. Um, all of this will be recorded. You will see all the previous webinars that we've done and any upcoming webinars on our website. That's ivmf.syracuse.edu slash COVID business. And that as well has a whole lot of other information that we've posted there. So stay tuned to that as well. So with that, um, if you're having connections issues, one last thing I would say is make sure that you're using um, either Firefox or Chrome. And also I just have to shout out to whoever said that they're from Oklahoma in the chat because I am from Oklahoma. So that should just point out that we are watching that chat and I now have an Oklahoma in the chat room. So really appreciate it guys. Um, so joining me today, I have Larry Stubblefield. He's the Associate Administrator for the Office of Veterans and Business Development at the Small Business Administration. So the only person in this group that has a longer title than me, but we're really excited to have him here. Um, we also have Candace Porter. She's the founding founder and managing director of Effective Flow or Connections, LLC. And then Jim O'Farrell, president and CEO of Advanced Management Strategies Group. So. With that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to hand it over to Larry to kind of give us updates about, you know, we know that the world's changing. There's a lot that's been happening. Anyone that has the Internet has now seen a lot of headlines. But what's what's the updates from the SBA side of things and what should business owners know as we continue to roll forward through this um, pandemic? OK, Misty, thank you very much. I, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. You know, so we've gone through the first phase, if you will, of the PPP. And just to give you an idea of, you know, uh, some of the successes. So for the PPP, you know, we processed 1.6 million loans in all 50 states and territories. We ramped up the number of lenders uh, that we have in the in the in the system from about 3,100 to almost 5,000 lenders to include community banks and credit unions. 20% of the funding that was processed was processed through lenders, 
who have less than a billion dollars in assets. And 60% of the funding was processed through lenders with $10 billion in assets or less. So no lender accounted for more than 5% of the, of the total amount of the, of the program. And the vast majority of these loans, 74% of them were for under $150,000. So, you know, we've taken a look at, you know, where did the, uh, where were the borrowers from, if you will. So, it, you know, it was in a variety of uh, industry sectors, if you will, to include construction, you know, manufacturing, you know, food and hospitality services, healthcare, agriculture, retail, on and on. And so I'm, I'm quoting the Secretary of Treasury now when he talks in terms of 30 million jobs have been saved through the, the PPP. So where we are now at SBA, we're, we're ramping up, getting ready for the second phase, if you will. The Paycheck uh, Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act uh, passed through the Senate yesterday. It's on its way to the House. Our preliminary uh, assessment of the act shows that for now, the PPP looks like we're going to pick up an additional $251 billion in that part of the program, another $50 billion for disaster, the economic uh, injury disaster loan, the advance for that, another $10 billion. Uh, it looks like farmers will be eligible for the uh, economic injury disaster loan. And then there's some discussion in terms of underserved communities you know, getting more of the funding into, uh, you know, the local banks really at the grassroots roots level. So that's where we are in terms of the PPP. I will tell you uh, for the economic injury disaster loan, you know, we're, we're uh, steadily working through those loans. There's about a million applications as we speak that are currently in the queue and we're, you know, we're still bringing on staff to include uh, loan officers, legal, and so forth. So we think we're in a pretty good position now for the the, uh, the next round, if you will. And, uh, uh, and we're looking forward to supporting the small business community. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. I really appreciate the updates. I think it's, it's good to kind of paint a picture about what's going on and then say, you know, here's what might be coming down or will be coming down the tunnel a little bit too. Um, and I think that, you know, we all, we're all excited to see what the new developments are and, um, you know, look forward to kind of the continued, you know, story that comes out of all of this. Um, and then also, you know, appreciate your time. I know that the SBA has been very, very kind of centered to this effort that we've been putting forward in terms of just weekly figuring out what we can do to meet, um, meet folks where where they're at and what with the changing kind of concerns that are that are happening so when um i know that everything's getting voted on and so we're looking at possibly knowing more or more details next week is that the is that the goal or where can they go to kind of find the most up-to-date information on what's changing or getting passed or where can where can veteran business owners kind of know to get the best kind of update out there well, you can always, um, business owners can always go to our, our website, but, okay. you know, a lot of, um, you know, where the program is going is actually in the, in the media. Um, yep. So if we, if we pay attention to the media, I mean, the, uh, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program is a very popular topic in the media. The media is following mm -hmm. the legislation, you know, it, as it moves from the Senate to the House. You're already reporting that the president has said uh, when it crosses his desk, he'll sign it. So, um, you know, that would be uh, one place for sure that um, veteran business owners can go to hear what's going on with that legislation. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. So I um, want to turn it over to kind of also some boots on the ground, right? So we have the business owners here to kind of ch talk about you know, what y'all are seeing um, from the front lines, what's going on with your personal businesses. I think it's pretty interesting, um, you know, by a little bit by design, a lot of it by uh, 
by luck, we have folks at, you know, DC for Jim, and then we also have Reno for Candace. So I think we have a good kind of juxtaposition about communities as well, because as we know, COVID and the responses are very different depending on where you're at. So if you're my family in Oklahoma, that governor's handled it completely different than if you're me in, in New York. So Candace, I want to turn it over to you to kind of talk about a little bit about who you are, what your company's seen, um, what sort of kind of considerations that you would advise for business owners. Yeah, thanks, Misty. So as Misty said, I'm located here in Reno, Nevada. And company is a management consulting company. So we consult on project management. We've also delivered training and we do a lot of facilitation. And so when we look at kind of COVID-19 and what I personally am experiencing as a business owner, um, a lot of the facilitation business just off the books, right off the bat, gone. There's really not anyone that's doing in-person meetings right now. And so that's something that we um, really just kind of put on hold. As far as the training services, it's been a lot of fun getting in there with my clients and rolling my sleeves up to figure out how we can continue to develop um, their employees during this time. Because a lot of people are now working from home, their work looks very different. And so it's a great time if you have the ability to take some training and focus on developing. Also, the kind of consulting side of things, a lot of businesses are now looking at what's our business continuity plan? You know, what can we do to adjust our strategic plans and our finances for maybe not just 2020, but for this year and a little bit beyond as the economy starts to come back. So I guess if I had to boil it down to some things that I'm looking at and I'm supporting clients with right now, one is really taking a deep dive look at finances. So number one, just mm -hmm. kind of looking at what's the must haves, what's the nice to haves, and what's missing from our current budget. So there's some opportunities to invest in some new technology so um, part of our team can continue to be successful and maybe even drive some new services that we haven't had before. And then of course, looking at where we can cut as far as overhead goes. And one thing that I know a lot of businesses are trying to prevent doing, if at all possible, is the layoffs of employees. Right. So where can we cut that is not people related? So that's one area, kind of really digging into those finances, taking the time, spending um, a good amount of time, I guess, looking at them and knowing where to adjust. I think another... Yeah really big one is looking at your social media presence. So if your clients you know, can't find you online or potential clients can't find you online, even though you're still offering services or new services, then that's a big one. So digging into your search engine optimization, maybe mm -hmm. spending time updating your website, making sure everything's accurate. And if you're not currently using a lot of tools that are out there, so Yelp, Google, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, what is it that you can start to establish a social media on? And I recommend whatever you stand up now, if you're investing time in that, make sure you're able to maintain it in the future so you're not investing a lot of time, energy, money in something that you know you won't have the team or the time to maintain. Yeah. Uh, I guess another thing is building partnerships. I'm finding that with everyone kind of sheltering in place or working from home or not going out, that now has been a great time to reach out to people that it's usually very hard to get time on their calendar and yeah. to be able to talk with them. You know, can you brainstorm new services offerings? Can you partner on something? And just checking and so building new partnerships and then nurturing your existing ones, just seeing how people are doing, seeing if there's opportunities now or in the future. That's great. You know, that's awesome. last and certainly not least, I think we're all 
thinking about what reintegration into the workplace looks like. And not only making your employees you know, feel safe psychologically, but also making sure that physically they're going to be safe. So really thinking about what that phase in process looks like as far as are we going to take temperatures as people come into work? Or are we going to offer gloves, mask? What's the kind of protocol or process if an employee is vulnerable or has vulnerable family members? Is there a way that you can put a process into place where they can request to continue to work from home? And if so, what does that work look like versus physically being in the workplace? Um, you know, people are the heart of small businesses. It really is true. And I'm hoping that there are some silver linings as far as people being reminded to look at small businesses and buy locally where all possible. Mm -hmm. Kind of to piggyback on what Larry said as far as that um, PPP program. You know, some of the big banks, I, I use a big bank right now, and they didn't really do the best of job of taking care of their small businesses when this program launched. And so I know that a lot of local kind of credit unions and some of the newly approved, um, I guess, banks that are now able to finance, I think they're really doing a good job of building relationships with local small businesses. And so it'll be interesting to see the transition as well. You know, someone that we can... Yeah see face to face or really easily connect with. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate all that feedback. And we're definitely going to um, dig into a lot of those points later. Um, so I have, I have a few things circled that we can that we can start to dig in. But before we do that, we also had Jim O'Farrell um, on on the chat. And I want to kind of take time to hear from Jim and and your company and what you're seeing and what are some of the points that you would offer up for small business owners as we start to push push forward sure hey everybody my name is jim o'farrell i am president and coo of a small business called advanced management strategies group and we have about 100 110 employees around the country um, from the D.C., Virginia area, all the way out west to yeah, Arizona and Albuquerque, New Mexico, and other places like that. And, I mean, honestly, if you had told me last April that we were going to be facing this crisis, I would have definitely told you you were crazy. Um, it has been quite a journey so far. Um, we kind of four areas um, for this, this presentation or discussion um, is human resources, communication, finance and operations. And I wanted to start with the, the, um, the above all of those and above everything that we keep uh, in our hearts of our in, in our minds about a business is character and leadership. Um, you are a business owner. Most of the folks on this call, I'm assuming today, are military veterans and served their country. And um, I always like to say when we raise a right hand, we write a blank check to Uncle Sam. But along with the blank check, we learn a lot of things in our military service, and one of them is leadership. And so you want to keep in your mind, in my mind, two things. One is always be leading from the front through this crisis from the beginning to the end, and then, and also to be communicating, communicating, communicating. Um, you can never over communicate in a crisis like this. And then there's kind of a third piece there, which is in any crisis, there's danger and there's opportunity. And I'll touch on the opportunity at the end. So as far as the human resources piece, for those of you who have employees in your in your business, um, we we had we partnered with a we basically outsourced our HR early on in our business when we first started up. And um, it's been very helpful to have um, a, a company called Insperity. Um, there are others out there like ADP and others that do your payroll and your HR. And it's been very helpful to have a company that has a web portal environment and they have tens of thousands of customers already and they're keeping up to date on what the latest um, HR rules and regulations that are being put out by the CDC and other government agencies regarding um, regarding the COVID-19 crisis. Um, even things like uh, your 401k plan, that you can actually take loans from your 401k plan right now penalty free, which is completely unheard of. Um, so things like that, having an HR partner that is, is going to stay up to speed on all of the um, rules and regulations. 
The second topic of communication, I said a minute ago, communicate, communicate, communicate. One of the ways that I started doing that when we headed into this crisis was a couple of things. First of all, I do a weekly update to the company um, every Friday. Um, here's what's going on with our company. Uh, we're still viable. We still have contracts. We still have all of our employees, or uh, actually right now all of our employees. And, um, and we're continuing to serve our customers. And I re the first time I sent one of those out, I received about 20 responses back from the employees saying, thank you, thank you for communicating. We're kind of sitting here at, in the evenings at home wondering, is AMSG going to survive this? And so as that weekly update has evolved, one of the things I did a couple weeks ago was I started asking the employees to send me your COVID-19 story. And the stories I've gotten back have been incredibly touching. I ask the employees permission if I can share them with the rest of the company. And it's a way to kind of build bonds within the company across geographic, geographic boundaries. So people that might not ever meet each other, somebody in Albuquerque, New Mexico, might not ever meet the person from, um, from Tennessee or the person from Fort Eustis in Williamsburg, Virginia. And yet mm -hmm. now they're, they're getting to know who each other are. Um, and so that's in the communication side. We also were doing daily stand-up meetings every morning with my ma my managers and directors to talk about what's going on. Um, hey, did you hear that um, the uh, Marine Corps has issued a decree that thou shalt wear a, a face mask if you're coming through the gates of the base um, to mm -hmm. support your customers? And then, and, you know, within 24 hours, that was kind of mandated across the federal government. So um, that gets into continuity of operation planning is you always have to stay up to speed on what the government and the customers are saying you have to do in order to continue serving them. Um, the finance, I won't go too far into this. Candace covered the finance side, but I, I do feel like when this first started, most of you should have or probably did create a three month uh, finance plan or a, or a budget. And right about now is the time to be updating it. And you should be looking at it every week to figure out um, what is holding true that you thought was going to hold true in that three month budget. Um, and then what is not holding true and what cuts might you have to make um, because you didn't expect um, certain things to happen. Um, the PPP um, Paycheck Protection Program is a whole other topic. Um, uh, Larry, you know, Larry covered some of that um, personal experience at AMSG. Um, we have, we do, and have used a community bank um, for years. Um, when we started up, we were with a large bank, and within about two years, I'd say, so we started in 2008. By around 2010-11, we switched to a community bank, and we have spent years, you know, fostering relationship with that community bank. And at the end of the day, we put in for some uh, support from the PPP and we didn't get anything. And they, they only had a very small number of loans that were processed through our community bank. Um, uh, but it, you know, it is what it is. And we're fortunate to see that another uh, tranche of funding is coming down the pike. So um, that's right. fine. Operations, um, the biggest thing there, a continuity of operations plan, having a plan and executing the plan. You know, COOP is key. Um, be sure you're constantly staying up to date on what the CDC is telling telling you. Misty mentioned a little while ago, we have the very case in point of what Misty was talking about. We have a governor in one state that's saying they're going to start reopening you know, next week, and we have governors in other states that are saying um, we're actually locking you down um, you know, tighter. <laughs> so um, it's been a very interesting um, experience. You have to be flexible. And you have to continue just to take in the information and make decisions. That's the other part of leadership, I believe, is, is don't sit on information. If you get information, you know, share it out to your, uh, your directors and employees um, and make sure that decisions are being made so you're not seen as a roadblock. Um, let's see. And then there are just a couple other things. Um, uh, one of them is upskill your staff. Look at opportunities to provide training. If people are cooped up at home, teleworking all the time, find them opportunities to do training. One of the things about this, uh, the platform that the uh, company that we use for HR has is a very robust training capability. So we have people taking some extra training right now. And then my final point is about exiting this uh, crisis pandemic is be looking for opportunities while we're in this uh, in the pandemic right now. Be looking for opportunities to transition your business 
um, and or offer additional service offerings. And I, I will use a couple of um, businesses that I that are local to me, and I know a lot of you are seeing this around the country. Um, a restaurant right near right near me, um, they've they've never done um, you know takeaway you know carry out food before. I know you all are seeing this, and all of a sudden they they couldn't have uh, customers inside the restaurant. And now they're having. Um, people come and drive up curbside and take the food away. Another uh, business that had never done meals, uh, they were a bakery and had done some sandwiches. And now they're, the owner is, I believe, of Greek descent and he's offering Greek food um, from out of their kitchen. So he's offering basically a completely new service offering related mm -hmm. to his existing business um, in order to keep uh, revenue coming in the door. So be looking out there for those kinds of opportunities where um, this this um, this business your business is being basically forced to do things a different way. And thank you, Misty, for giving me the opportunity yeah. today, and you as well, Larry. I think that you know I think that you made a lot of great points there. And again, we're we're about we're going to turn over to some question and answers now. Um, you know, especially around the look for new opportunities. We have a restaurant right here in Syracuse. It's a veteran-owned restaurant, and he opened up, I think, the month before COVID hit. So brand new restaurant is all of a sudden shut down due to COVID. So that's that's rough, right? But then all of a sudden he now, because he is a gluten-free, you know, et cetera, et cetera, restaurant, realizes that I can actually cater to first responders, hospitals, other things like medical areas because I meet all of these criteria and so now basically his entire business has flipped and been able to bring back on a lot of folks um, to do that so agree wholeheartedly with that um, and then you know upskilling your staff so let's I saw a couple things come through the chat around HR so Jim I'm sure you know of a lot of different programs out there you guys have a, an HR group that you work with that you love if companies are maybe slightly smaller um, not ready to take on maybe a contract with an external HR that's quite that size have you heard of you know or trying to avoid some consultant fees right now have you heard of other like internship style through Skillbridge or have you heard of other groups that might be more I guess size appropriate or maybe price appropriate or for you is it just worth the price would you start to have another pro kind of take that over is that something that people need to be thinking of as an investment for their hr services yeah you're one of the um one of the other free slash subscription based slash inexpensive types of opportunities can be um if you're familiar with the the MOOCs, the massively open online courses mm -hmm. that universities are offering through platforms like coursera so that's course with ERA on the end of it. That's another um, platform that that folks might want to investigate. Um, they have, you know, basically what that is in a nutshell is colleges and universities around the country and actually around the world have been offering their curriculum for free. Um, initially, it was for free a couple of years ago, and now they're starting to offer a nominal um, subscription. Um, I know people personally that are they'll have a the the uh, Coursera will have a 30 day subscription, but the first any classes you take in the first 30 days are free, and then you can cancel after 30 days. And I've known some business owners that are taking them uh, two and three at a time, um, and then canceling after 30 days. But I don't you know recommend that as an ongoing I, thing. But it's a way to get some training. Yeah, and I would also look out. We see we've seen someone. We'll share them um, on the IVMF dot syracuse dot edu slash covid business site we've seen a couple of um what we're calling the mr rogers company so there's a famous quote by mr rogers that says you know in a time of crisis or his mom said you know in a time of crisis always look for the helpers um and we've seen some great companies too that have been offering classes have been offering discounted health care etc for you know companies that are going through this that might want to offer it out um, another one for upskilling employees if you guys have not looked into it you know, shameless plug, but onward opportunity. Um, if you're looking for if you're looking for upskilling, PMP, anything like that, and you're a veteran uh, or military spouse or National Guard Reservist, you can get all of that for free through onward opportunity. So, all your CISSP. So, if you're looking at that, it's a good time. Um, okay, guys. So let's talk through. Um, you know, 
Candice, you mentioned it's time to look at your finances. It's time to look at your SEO. It's time to look at all these things. You know, Jim, you touched on a whole bunch of it. So in addition to, you know, nonprofit organizations, we've seen them score SBA resource partners. What resources do you all as business owners leverage to say, how do I, you know, help identify and pivot and adjust to these new customer habits? Because as we all know, the world's not going to just turn on. It's going to come in phases and customers might be shopping in different ways. They might be looking for new things and business might be doing different things. So what resources would you leverage during these times for any of that, but also just for like general mentorship and what should companies be doing? So if you don't mind, I'll jump in here because I want to echo um, what Jim said in regards to outsourcing HR. I also have outsourced my HR um, in the last year, and it's one of the best things that I've done, especially when trying to get payroll numbers for um, the PPP. And, you know, some of them are very affordable as far as outsourcing. I use Just Works, is what it's called, and they do it per employee in your organization. I think it's $49 per employee exactly. to process payroll. So it, it's yeah. not this monster $10,000 contract or yeah. something. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing, Candace. A lot of them have moved away from that, like set large dollar monthly fee, right? They've, they're going with the employee. So you can, we actually had a deal several years ago with another company where it was until you hit a hundred employees, it was like, like you just said, 49 or 49 or $50 a month per employee. So if you can bake that into the cost of your goods, cost of services you're providing, it's, it, it's not a, a monumental expense up front. Mm -hmm. what I, just speaking from experience, having been in several small businesses, and I, I think Candace, you would agree with this too, is w in my previous small businesses, we had an HR director. And he or she, what I learned was they only knew what they knew, the knowledge that was in their head. And what you get from these outsourced HR companies is the ability to, to tap into different resources that they have. In some cases, it could be an, a lawyer. You need some employment law support in addition to your payroll. So sorry to jump in, Candace, but I couldn't, couldn't resist. You nailed it. It's, it's cheaper than people. No, it's, it's great because, you know, growing from a small business, you know, I started as a small LLC where I'm not running payroll and most of my team members were 1099s. And then you get to a point where you're ready to start running payroll, even if you're your only employee and then maybe you're going to bring on some employees. And that's the point where I knew I needed help. And looking out there, researching and understanding that there's companies that are made to work with tiny businesses and grow with them. And so I think that's just a really good way. And then they negotiate all of these small businesses. They negotiate their health care, their benefits all together, and you get better rates. And so it can help you be more competitive in regard to the benefits that you're offering to your employees as well when it's time to offer those. So I think, Jim, that's such a great point. Yeah. And then it keeps you organized. You can link your payroll directly to QuickBooks if that's what you use. And you can run reports. And they send you all of these updates. The COVID-19, I'm getting the same thing from JustWorks. They're sending all the updates. Here's things to think about. So that's one thing that I, I cannot say has helped me enough. Um, as far as some other resources, well, see, and the library Go ahead, Jim. Real quick. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, that, well, just before you go to that other subject, on the subject of outsourcing, the other thing every a lot of companies are doing, and I most, I'm sure you all know about this, but just in case you don't, you know, there are a lot of outsourced um, facilities, you know, office space, like we, we've we used the WeWork and a couple of others, Regis, and that's something that then you get into a crisis like this if everybody, if they say everybody needs to telework, if you're on a month by month uh, relationship with a WeWork or a Regis or one of the others, it's a lot easier to, to bring those costs right back in and say, okay, you're going to be at your home. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to maybe have to provide you a laptop or I'm going to get you a MiFi hotspot or whatever it is. And we've had those situations come up. Um, but it's it, for cost looking at the uh, office space. And that's another thing that I just see is going to be a huge 
change coming out of this pandemic because we're going to see people do the teleworking, uh, remote working much more frequently than mm -hmm. the old school model, which I grew up with. Was you could I you must not be working because I can't see you. I can't physically. You must not be. You know it's so that's just going to fall by the side. I'm I'm hoping. Sorry, Candace. No, that's great. That's all great. I I think some of the most helpful tools that I've seen in regards to small businesses during this time, SBA is always a great resource. They're putting out a lot of information. So um, thanks to Larry and the whole SBA team. I also have connected with my local SCORE office and they're a great resource as well as far as it's a lot of times kind of retired business owners or experts, and then some that are still business owners that can give back. They've been doing a lot of great webinars as well to kind of help you think outside the box in regards mm -hmm. to how you can modify your business. And I know we've said it over and over, but what can you outsource as far as eliminating some of that overhead and still be successful? You know, what new tools can you implement? saw the other day that Zoom, the meeting system, um, went from about 10 million to 200 million users from the beginning of COVID-19. And right. I know that they're putting some additional security measures in place now, but it's been great for a training tool as far as upskilling employees. So they've got the capability to do breakout rooms and send you know, your meeting into smaller groups to work on something or apply what they've learned. So again, kind of re-evaluating your overall like tools and technologies that are available to you is great. So I think that you know you all you all brought um, some definite like great points on there. I think that one thing is is a lot of corporations like Zoom has been doing a lot right now to help people get on there, and we're sharing a lot of what corporations are doing so that you can see like what are the Google platforms that are out there, what is Zoom doing, what are what are these you know, companies doing to help small business owners. But you both pull on a thread that I really want to drive into that, you know, and, and Jim, you said it best with your quote, right? That in every crisis, there's danger and there's opportunity. And um, then also Candace, you know, you just pointed out a, a lot of people are going to be working from home now. And I think that you're going to see a lot of companies, you know, if we look at this in three phases, right? Right now we're in response. Soon enough, hopefully we'll start working towards recovery. And then you're going to see a resurgence. And I think in that resurgence, you're going to see new industries, new companies, new opportunities, because folks are going to say, you know what, it's a lot cheaper for people to work at home. And, you know, there's different things, you know, people are going to change the way they shop and things like that. So with all these opportunities, what, what opportunities are you all seeing as business owners? What, you know, if you, if you were going to start a company right now, like what things do you think that you'd be focusing on that you feel might be coming in the next, you know, 12, 6, 12, 18 months? Jim, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, we are uh, AMSG. We're in the federal government space. So we, um, do a lot of work um, in providing services to our federal government across the nation. And one of the things that um, somebody actually put up on the um, in the chat, I saw that CMMC capability matur maturity model for cyber. It's a huge requirement that's coming down the pike for government contractors so that the bad guys can't hack into us like they like they try to hack into the Fed. Uh, the federal systems all the time, and so right now, if you have if you had IT people, um, that that is a there is a cottage industry that was already forming pre COVID uh, nineteen. If you are in any way related to the IT industry, the IT business in the in the commercial side, you could come into the government if you had the right quals and had the right plan, and the government will pretty much tell you here's what you need to be. Um, here's what you need to have. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a, an error message here that's saying I'm about to be signed out from the login. It's kind of weird. Speaking of IT, hope I haven't been hacked. Um, so anyway, <laughs> that's one of the main areas that I would put forward. If you were going to start a business in, I would look at um, this, this cyber area and then mm -hmm. um, uh, because of this, a lot of security breaches have been happening as we've been moving to much more remote work. 
Perfect. Thanks. Sorry. No, that's great. Candace, do you have anything to add? Candace, or do you I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. You know, I spend a lot of time working in the learning and development space. Um, all of my clients right now are actually in the private sector. And so I think I have a little bit of a different view. And, you know, I typically travel 50%, I'd say, for work. And I think that it's going to be a long time before people are back to their regular travel routines, going and physically being in rooms with individuals. And so where I'm seeing a lot of opportunities is where you can offer services remotely as far as even full day trainings. So things that, oh my gosh, how can we sit on a computer for a full day and do a training? So mm -hmm. finding things that work. You know, I've been offering a 9 a.m. to a 4 p.m. online virtual training with an hour for lunch. And so you've got a three hour block on each side of lunch, a 15 minute break in the middle, and then really taking advantage of technology as far as allowing people to go into breakout rooms and apply what they're learning. And so it doesn't feel like a full day of just sitting in front of the computer. Right. Um, really encouraging people to turn their cameras on. It helps you feel so much more connected. So yeah. uh, I think that's another space, anything that you can do supporting online is a great opportunity and I think that Jim hit the nail on the head we're gonna see a lot of organizations that maybe have physical office space that are gonna start wondering why they're spending so much money on that overhead so can we use shared offices can we have a percentage of our um, employees permanently work from home or can we rotate doing some type of hoteling offices so anything that supports employees working from home as well from a security technology standpoint yeah perfect thanks so much um so jim i know that you said it and i've seen it come up now a couple you know a couple of uh, a couple of times but when it comes to your message about that you do weekly around covid um, that's not necessarily a requirement that you've seen right um, or what you you know from anyone in particular and do you know if there's any like requirements I've seen a lot of companies that have come out and said you've got to start talking to your employees and let them know what your thought process is and help them kind of understand what's going ahead so that they can be making the best decisions they can in their roles and right now that open communication is vital because it's very hard to have you know those sort of relationships as you know small talk around the office is no longer a thing so when we do meetings at our at IVMF right now we save a few minutes of each meeting to just kind of have that talk and talk about what's going on in life but from what you know this is something that you think is uh, a great to have for a company and almost a need to have but it's not necessarily required to have correct like it, there's no law saying this is the question that I'm seeing that like you have to start talking about COVID you have to provide resources correct in the chat that's correct you were breaking yeah. up there some are you asking me to comment about the weekly update that I'm doing is that I'm sorry right I, I so, yeah, so basically I just want to a sorry a clarify that it's not I'm seeing in the question a lot of people are saying are we required to update employees are we required to give them you know, the uh, latest on resources. Yeah. And then, yeah. so if no, then what what parts or what, if we could just kind of reiterate, what parts, how should we be communicating to employees? And then how do we use part of that communication to then communicate to our customers about what we're doing and what they can expect from us during this time? Because to Candace, like, you yeah. have to be viable so, on social so media. We'll, Go for it. Yeah, yeah so the first thing, with the first update that I did, I, I um, explained to the employees that we have um, we had created a um, continuity of operations plan, and we are now executing that plan. And here are the top three mm -hmm. things that we're doing in that continuity of operations plan. And I just gave each of them like three sentences: boom, boom, boom. So it's not I'm mm -hmm. not overwhelming you with information, but I'm telling you that I'm demonstrating to you that we are in control 
of what we can control in this crisis. And we have a plan to get through this together. And so that was number one. Right in, in, in line with that, in parallel with that, we sent a letter to each of our customers and said, these are the steps that we are taking to ensure that we continue to support you um, as best we can, given the, the move to telework and all of the other things that are going on. And we gave specific details. Here are the, the people in our company that support you as the customer. Here's how they're going to stay connected. Um, here's what the, here are the tasks that they're going to work on. And at that time, we had four weeks of tasks at a high level for each of them, just you know, what they would be doing. And we did that for each project. Mm -hmm. did, and we heard from our customers after the fact was that it gave them a, a comfort a sense of comfort that, hey, while well, all this craziness is happening around me, I know that this teammate of mine, this business partner of mine, is going to be there with me. Yeah. Um, management training. Yeah. I'm seeing, I'm, I am seeing things pop up in the Zoom and I'm trying to react if people are. I saw somebody, by the way, also earlier, Misty, that, that put score.org. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of score as well, that it's a great organization for people to get resources. And where I go with that is the SBA, as Larry knows, the SBA, I think Larry would agree, is kind of overwhelmed by the fact that they've done 14 years of loans in 14 days, and now they're going to get to do it all over again. So there are other resources out there. Sorry, a little bit of a tangent, but on that score yeah, note, they, um, there are other resources out there for small business owners to get to access for help with going through the PPP process round two. And I did want to make sure um, that I mentioned that you are you should be talking to your banker like almost every day right now. They, you're, you want to know that your banker is preparing for the round two, which you brought up earlier, Misty, should be happening mm -hmm. next week um, once it gets signed by the White House. By the president. Right. And then and we'll release information. I don't know, Larry, if you know right now or if SBA or anyone knows that when that round two comes out, if folks are reapplying or you know, are the applications that are sort of in the queue, the waiting on more funds applications, are those like good to go or do they have to reapply? So I don't know if you know that answer, if you need to ask someone that, but. No, for the for the PPP, you know, as, as Jim indicated, um, it, uh, the feedback we're getting is, uh, you know, uh, borrowers who have gone into their lenders, the lenders, like in, in uh, fact, I was talking to a business owner earlier today whose lender has agreed to hold the application in process or in place rather, and then process it once the, um, you know, once the bill is signed into law. So Jim's point, I agree with, agree with him 100 percent. You should definitely be in touch with your lender on a daily basis going forward. And then for the economic injury disaster loan, those loans that are, are in the queue, we're, we're processing them as well. You'll hear something from our Office of Disaster uh, Assistance. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think everyone has to realize, right, that we are, all of us, business owners, VSOs, SBA, you know, I think the whole world right now is building the car while we drive it is the best way to say it, right? So we're all looking at, you know, what do we need to do right now? And then figuring out how we can quickly kind of, you know, build the cars, we keep going and then, you know, change things and try to stay as as agile as we can through all of this. But you have to realize that through that, you know, Jim, you made a great point earlier that you got to look at your budget and you got to look at your strategy now weekly. And I think that that's an important point that we can't be married to anything because we just have to make sure that that flexibility stays. I think another point that, you know, Candace and I know Jim, you've also made is that, you know, when talking to your customers, just point blank, tell them what's going on and what they can expect from you and also what you might need from them. You know, so I think that that's a, it's a good time to kind of, give people a, a, a good gentle call to action on a few things as well. Um, I think as we as we kind of push forward, I'm going to ask just a couple more questions. Folks, if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat. Another thing that would be great to put in the chat is next week we're going to have, you know, a, a Facebook live and, uh, you know, a fireside chat that again is tackling the questions that you want to know about. So if you have subjects that you haven't seen covered that you're interested to hear more about, 
please also put them in there because we'll make sure, again, that we're just meeting the entrepreneurs where they're at and we're answering the questions that they have. Um, and and we'll definitely go go forward uh, from there too. So, Candice, folks are you know working differently right now. I think that you know never before in my life have I you know hosted a Zoom with my you know veteran owned businesses and the SBA and funders, and then turn around and taught someone about parabolas and quadratic equations, and then turn around and try to take care of everything else that might need might need to happen in a day. So, you know, what are your tips for employees that are looking um, for, you know, advice about like, how do we work differently? How do you main, maintain that flexibility of folks that are trying to juggle 400 new balls in the air, but also have to have, you know, things done at the end of the day, work at, you know, work Absolutely. Done at the end of the day. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I was just working with a client on this yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. they are, they're considered essential, although they were taking, you know, as many safety precautions as possible. So they let everyone work from home and now they're reintegrating. And, right. you know, she was saying I'm hearing really mixed reviews about the comfort levels of people coming back to the workplace or, you know, the day to day interactions. And what we talked about is making sure that your employees are part of the solutions. And so having something in place to gather feedback from your employees, because as the HR director or as a leader within the organization, you're not going to be hearing, you know, all of the whispers throughout the workplace as far as what makes someone uncomfortable or what could be done better. And so making sure that you are opening up those conversations, holding meetings where people can provide suggestions, but then also putting in a feedback mechanism where people can send feedback anonymously. I think that's really important. So there's simple tools that you can use. You know, you could set up a SurveyMonkey account that ask, you know, here's what's the situation, explain it, and then what's your proposed solution. And then if you want to be part of implementing a solution, you know, you can put your name if you so choose. But I think that that is going to be the way to help get all of your employees on board to make sure that you're addressing the day to day challenges, whether it's technology, whether it's, you know, I feel like we need more hand sanitizer or this person showed up sick. What's the process for asking them to go home? You know, just all of those different things. So I guess to go back to your original question, involve employees in developing solutions to make sure that everyone is set up for success moving forward. Awesome. Thank you. So we have just about eight minutes left. So I have one more question um, and then want to make sure that, you know, we have enough time to tell folks about what's happening next. So one question that I always um, want to ask is, had one piece of advice or and I know that Jim might be off and we'll get him in if you had one piece of advice or if you had a book or a podcast or you know just a quote to live by anything that you'd want to make sure that these entrepreneurs leave with today that they have as a go forth and conquer or whatever it is what would that be so while you think about that um, uh, I'm going to just give a couple of um, updates. So, guys, next week we will have a, a Facebook Live. Just check out our, our website, our social media. It's idmf.syracuse.edu slash COVID business, and you can see all of that on May 6th. Same time, same place, new link. We're going to have another follow-up webinar for everyone that, again, tackles the questions what we see as um, – as the challenges right now. So please send that in to us as we go. So with that, Jim, I saw that you just popped back on. Um, what we're asking is if there's one piece of advice, quote, podcast, book, anything that you would leave for these business owners before we have to wrap up today, what would it be? So Candace Larry, do you want to kick off? Okay. Yeah. This is Jim. I, I actually was on the whole time for some reason. The video shut down. The, I was hearing everything you said. It was amazing. I
seeing the you two. Anyway, um, <laughs> very strange. Yeah, th there you go. We're, we're still with the technology. I Let me just go first and I'll just say, um, Misty, first of all, thank you all. Thank you for hosting this today. It's been really, I've learned a lot um, from li listening to you and Larry and, and Candace talking. Um, but I would say, first of all, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. We will be sitting here in April of 21, knock on wood, I should so, and we'll be looking at this in the rear view mirror and what will be different. I just wish if we could transport ourselves to April of 2021, what will be different and what business opportunities will each of us be saying, man, I wish I had jumped on that and taken advantage of that and built a business offering around that within my existing business or pivoted my entire business to that that channel or that new opportunity. So that's the one thing. And then um, I coach lacrosse in this in my spare time at the high school level. And the book that we always give the kids the last couple of years is Make Your Bed uh, by yep. Emma McCraven. And so if there's yep. a book, I would still ask people to go out there and read because if you do nothing else in this crisis, but get out of your bed, if you're stuck at home and make it, and that'll be your first success of the day and it will lead to more. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate it. Okay. Candace? Yes, I'm also a big reader. I love audiobooks as well. And I would say, you know, think outside the box. And everyone always says, think outside the box. But don't let kind of past workplace traditions limit you. Really mm -hmm. just dive right in. Think about how you can continue to grow your business. And I love the book Mindset by Carol Dweck. It talks about really embracing a growth mindset versus a fixed where, oh, we can't really do anything about that. Whereas a growth is more about, let's think about it. The possibilities are endless and I wanna learn and I wanna educate and I wanna instill this growth mindset. So that's a great one. It's also available on audiobook. So that would be my recommendation to hope prompt some of those creative ways of thinking. Thanks, appreciate it. Larry, are you still on? I am. And in fact, I would just I would just say that uh, Jim and Candace have talked about SCORE. Uh, here at SBA, we are totally, totally focused on the small business community as we go through this pandemic. And I would just say that, you know, for any of your business needs, you know, turn to the SBA. You know, we are, you know, our 68 district offices, you know, we have SCORE chapters all around the country, the small business development centers, the women business centers, all told, you know, we're talking about 1,200 locations and maybe about 14,000 business advisors who are leaning forward, ready to help the small business community. Yeah. Thanks so much, Larry. And thanks again to all our panelists. Thanks again for everyone tuning in. Um, make sure you check out for more updates, ivmf.syracuse.edu slash COVID business. Um, also, please reach out to us on social media. Let us know what you want to hear from next, and we'll make sure that we put it in the hopper and we have it ready for you all so that we can continue to get you the information that you need. Um, Again, really appreciate everyone logging in today. Also, really, really appreciate our panelists for making the time. I know it's very hectic right now. And of course, for the SBA for getting us the connections to the panelists and all that you all are doing to you know, enable us to push forward. So with that, we're gonna wrap up. We're gonna, you know, I hope that everyone has a, a great week and now has a few new things that they're thinking about as they move forward. Um, you know, into the into the next phase of, of our new world. So appreciate everyone, appreciate everyone's time. Thanks.